Hi, welcome to Introduction to the Chi-Squared Distribution. So the Chi-Squared Distribution is a very useful tool for comparing experimental data with the predictions of a scientific hypothesis. Here we're going to give a quick intro to the Chi-Squared Distribution. Now, this video is only going to cover the very basics of a chi-squared distribution. And it will be from the perspective of using a chi-squared distribution to quantify how well an experimental observation agrees with a specific predetermined scientific hypothesis. And what we're doing here will be a particularly simple example of the use of a chi-squared distribution. The chi-squared distribution actually has a lot of uses, which are more complicated than the one that will be shown here. We will very briefly mention some of these complications at the end of the video. Okay, so the first thing to know is that there isn't just a single chi-squared distribution. It's actually a set of distributions. These distributions are labeled by a positive integer that we're going to call k. So k can take on the values 1, 2, 3, etc. And so we have these different chi-squared distributions that are labeled by the value of k. The first five of these distributions are shown in the plot at right. K is what is called the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so in order to discuss the chi-squared distribution, we should first talk about Gaussian measurement errors. And I'm going to give a quick review of that in a minute. But you might be interested in checking out the videos in the Gaussian Statistics playlist and the Hypothesis Testing playlist available on this channel before you watch this video. Okay, so let's give a quick review of Gaussian errors. So, let's say we're doing a measurement. We're going to make a single measurement of some physical quantity which we're going to call Q. Now, we're going to call the true value of Q, Q true, and we're going to call the measured value of Q, Q measured. Now, since measurements are not perfect, in general, Q measured is not going to equal Q true, and the error is equal to the difference between them, so Q measured minus Q true. Now here, we're taking the errors to be Gaussian, and we're taking our uncertainty to be a quantity that we call sigma. Under these conditions, Q measured will be Gaussian distributed around Q true. So what does that mean? So let's take a small interval, a distance away from Q true, that we're going to call little q. And let's take this interval to have a width delta, which we're going to take to be small. The probability that Q measured will fall between little q and little q plus delta is in the limit of tiny delta, delta times the height of the Gaussian curve at little q. And more generally, the probability for q measured to land between two values, little q1 and little q2, is the area under the curve between little q1 and little q2. This lets us make some interesting statements about how far away Q measured will likely fall from Q true. So, in about 68% of measurements, Q measured will fall within one sigma of Q true. 
In about 95% of measurements, Q measured will fall within 2 sigma of Q true. And in about 99.7% of measurements, Q measured will fall within 3 sigma of Q true. Okay, so that was a quick review of Gaussian errors. Now we can start talking about a chi-squared distribution for one degree of freedom. So a chi-squared distribution for the case k equals 1. So let's say before we do the experiment, we have some hypothesis about the true value of q. And under this hypothesis, the value of q is a quantity that we'll call q0. Now if the hypothesis is true, and q0 is the true value of q, then the measured value q measured should be Gaussian distributed around q0. So here we have the same plot that we had before, but now the value at the bottom of the plot is labeled q0, whereas before it just said q true. Okay, so now we do our measurement. And we get our measured value, q measured. So how do we quantify the agreement or disagreement of q measured with q naught? So let's take the difference between q measured and q naught in units of sigma. So this means let's take q measured minus q naught divided by sigma. And now let's square that difference. So now we have q measured minus q naught over sigma all squared. Well, that's our chi squared for one degree of freedom. Our chi squared equals q measured minus q naught over sigma all squared. So let's relate this back to our Gaussian distribution that we saw earlier. We said that the probability that q measured would fall between little q and little q plus delta was in the limit of tiny delta, delta times the height of the Gaussian curve at little q. So under our hypothesis, that the true value of q is q naught, the height of that Gaussian curve at q measured is just given by a Gaussian distribution. And if we look at the exponent in that Gaussian distribution, we can see that it's just minus one half our chi squared value. Okay, so here's a plot of the probability density for a chi squared with one degree of freedom you can see it's sharply peaked at low values of chi-squared. Okay, so at this point, this might all seem a bit silly. So why not just quantify the difference between q measured and q naught by the number of sigma? Wouldn't that be easier? So this might seem more reasonable when we look at the case of more than one degree of freedom, so the case where k is greater than one. So let's take a look at that, the chi-squared for k degrees of freedom. So to make this simple, let's start with k equals 2. So let's say we're doing two measurements, and they are of two different observables, which we're going to call p and q. Again, we'll take the errors to be Gaussian distributed. So we're going to take the errors on both p and q to be Gaussian distributed. The uncertainty on q we'll call sigma q, and the uncertainty on p we'll call sigma p. And we're going to take the measurements of p and q to be independent from each other. So under those conditions, q measured should be Gaussian distributed around q true, and p measured should be Gaussian distributed around p true. 
And I should point out that we are not assuming that P true is equal to Q true, and we are also not assuming that the uncertainties are the same. So we're not assuming that sigma P is equal to sigma Q. Now, again, let's say we have some scientific hypothesis that predicts values for both P and Q. This hypothesis says that P will have the value P naught and Q will have the value Q naught. So under this hypothesis, we would expect Q measured to be Gaussian distributed around Q naught and we would expect P measured to be Gaussian distributed around P naught. Now, under our hypothesis, we can write down the joint probability density function for Q measured and P measured. And I'm just gonna call that F of Q measured and P measured. To get the probability that Q measured and P measured fall in specified tiny intervals, delta Q and delta P, analogous to what we did earlier, we multiply those interval widths by F of Q measured and P measured. Now we said that Q measured and P measured were independent. So to get the joint probability density function, we just multiply the probability density functions of Q measured and P measured together. And so we get that F is just this product of the two Gaussians. So you can see the first Gaussian has Q measured and Q naught and sigma Q in it. And the second Gaussian has P measured and P naught and sigma P in it. Okay, so now we do both of these measurements and we get our measured values, Q measured and P measured. So here we show a case where the measured value of Q, Q measured, falls a little bit to the right of Q naught, and the measured value of P, P measured, falls a little bit to the left of P naught. Okay. So to quantify the agreement or disagreement of the observed values with our scientific hypothesis, we construct the same quantity as we did before for both Q and for P. So we construct Q measured minus Q naught over sigma Q, all squared, and P measured minus P naught over sigma P, all squared. And then to get our chi-squared, we just add those two together. So our chi-squared is equal to Q measured minus Q naught over sigma Q, all squared, plus P measured minus P naught over sigma P, all squared. Okay, so like we did before, let's relate this expression back to the probability density function, in this case, the joint probability density function that we had for Q measured and P measured. Okay, so if we look back at that joint probability density function that we had for Q measured and P measured, so the quantity that we called F, it was a product of two Gaussians, one of which contained Q and one of which contained P. Now we can take the two exponents in that expression and put them together such that we have just one exponent. And if we look at that exponent, we can see that just like it was for the K equals one case, that exponent is equal to minus one half our chi-squared value. Okay, so here's the probability density for a chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. So for k equals two. And we can see that it tends to take on higher values than the k equals one case that we saw before. Okay, so now let's move on to the more general case. This time we're going to make k such measurements. And we're going to label which measurement we're talking about by the index i. So the measured values we're going to call q submeasured i. Their predicted values are going to be q naught i. And their uncertainties are sigma i. Okay, so in order to construct our chi-squared, we do the following. 
For each of the measurements, we take the difference between the measured value and the predicted value and divide it by the uncertainty on that measurement. Then we square that and once we've done that for each of the measurements we add up all of those results. And that's our chi-squared. It's a measure of the agreement between the measured and the predicted values. Now the mean value of the chi-squared distribution for k degrees of freedom is k and its standard deviation is the square root of 2k. If your hypothesis and uncertainties are correct, you should expect the value of your observed chi-squared to be around k with a standard deviation of the square root of 2k. If your observed chi-squared is much larger than this, you should seriously consider the possibility that your hypothesis or your uncertainties are significantly off. Okay, so I did say that we would mention a brief complication at the end of the video, so here we go. Here we've looked at a particularly simple use of a chi-squared distribution, but they have a lot of uses and many of those uses are more complicated than what we talked about here. We're not going to cover them here, but we will mention one important point. For some other applications, like if you're using a chi-squared distribution to fit parameters to measured data, or if you're doing tests of independence of variables, the appropriate value of k to use is not the number of observations. These cases are more complicated and we didn't cover them here, but it is important to be aware that these situations exist. Okay, so let's summarize. Here we took an introductory look at the chi-squared distribution. The chi-squared is actually a set of distributions labeled by k, where k is the number of degrees of freedom. And the chi-squared distribution is useful in comparing measured values of observables to their values predicted by some scientific hypothesis.